Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Malika, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Malika. I'm just taking a look at the clock to try to keep track of time here. Um, So this is my first time to this meeting. Thank you, Nikki, for inviting me to speak. I have just over a year sober now um, and have one service commitment at Adeline Group, and that is most of the measurable parts of my role. I have a sponsor we meet about once a week or so. And even though I have a year, um, I'm a very imperfect, stubborn person, and I have barely worked any of the steps at this point, but I do a lot of other things I'll get to um, in a second um, that really have helped me throughout this year, and I look forward to starting to move forward through the steps. But um, it's interesting. It's sort of become more clear to me that I am an alcoholic once I became sober, because when I was drinking, I did a lot of... Um, noticing the things that proved to myself that I wasn't an alcoholic. Like, I still had a job, I had friends, I hadn't betrayed anyone, um, I was functioning okay, I had a feeling that I could probably be doing better if I wasn't drinking and smoking pot so much, but I could prove to myself in all these different ways that I was doing all right. Um, so it's been in my sobriety and reflecting back on when I was drinking that it's like I've had those like, oh, 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 like maybe this is where I should be moments. Um, and within that, I realized like even when I first started drinking in high school, um, I would drink alcoholically. But again, I would also often be the designated driver. I grew up in Sonoma County, um, so you have to drive everywhere, and I like being in control. So I would have no problem being designated driver, which means I wouldn't drink. I just smoke hella weed instead, um, <laughs> because where I grew up, that wasn't really considered the same as I don't know, people talk about smoking weed as like having a morning cup of tea, and it was very um, accepted. Um, So, but when I would drink, I would drink till I was blacking out or throwing up or wobbling around um, and would definitely drink to get drunk. Even now, I don't really believe that there are people who don't drink to get drunk. (laughs) Why why would you be drinking then? I don't get it. Um, And... I feel like part of why, like, I don't really remember my first drink that clearly, but as I said, I was in high school, and I was drinking wine with my friends, and I think I blacked out, Um, but I didn't have that, like, oh, my God, this is magical moment, but it's just sort of, I guess my personality, once I do something, um, then I didn't really grow up with clear boundaries, so, like, that boundary is gone, now I drink, and so I would just go for it now, and then it just became something that I did, Uh, but looking back, I realized that I had some traumas that I would just hold on to from when I was a child and I had this like secret world of pain and I had found other ways of soothing myself but when I started drinking and then smoking pot that summer when I was 16 um, that became a really easy way to sort of skate through um, and help me cope and bury up some of my traumas and I had this double life where I was still like getting straight A's. I'm the oldest sibling, so I'd help out with my siblings. My parents divorced. I was like my mom's therapist, best friend, second mom, um, and could do all these things. And then I would reward myself by just ridiculousness. And I would say, you know, like, I deserve it. It's okay for me to make decisions that maybe I'd look down upon if someone else is doing it. But I'm also, you know, doing, I'm working so hard doing all these other things to maintain the image of, like, happy, positive help for Malika that I deserve to um, get hella stoned and watch people play video games or get drunk and um, forget where my car is, or I would uh, rationalize it for myself. Um, And my drinking sort of ebbed and flowed. It spiked when I was in college, and then I sort of calmed down after college, and I developed more traumas. Um, when I was there, uh, aided by substance abuse. And then when I moved to Oakland about four years ago, I didn't know a lot of people. And so I found (coughs) safety, um, and comfort in the club bar scene because I love dancing and going out is an easy way to feel, um, not alone. And so my drinking spiked again here. And I started to have little, 
um, wake up calls that maybe things weren't going the way I wanted them to, which I easily ignored. Again, that like, well, I haven't lost my job. I haven't gotten in trouble. Like nothing really terrible has happened on paper. I still look fine. Um, Mm -hmm. But one night I crashed my car and I was really lucky to not get a DUI. I crashed within a couple blocks of my house, totaled my car, um, but was able to drive home so I didn't have to call a tow truck. And um, I just decided to let that be my last wake up call because they were starting to escalate. Like I don't want it to get to the point where I do kill somebody or harm myself or end up in jail um, or hospitalized before I decide to do something about this. So I had been introduced to AA already. I came back. Someone at the first meeting I came to said she'd be my temporary sponsor. I was like, okay, temporary is something I can handle. (laughs) (laughs) So I said, fine. She became my sponsor um, for the first six months of my bride till she went out of town, and now I have a new sponsor. And as I said, although I haven't worked many of the steps, I... Really, um, when I ever think of having a drink, um, talk myself through and remind myself why I'm here in the first place and all the embarrassing, shameful shit and also that that escalating of consequences that was starting to happen. And I'm also really enjoying getting to know myself without burying my stuff anymore. Um, I am also in therapy and my therapist put me in a group for people dealing with trauma and substance abuse. And in the past, like, three months of my sobriety, my sobriety, my trauma has started to bubble to the surface, which is a lot, but also feels good because it means that I can't suppress it anymore. And I get to, as my therapist said, um, I'm just starting the recovery from my trauma. So I'm in the recovery from alcohol, and now I didn't realize this was what I was signing up for, but I get to really um, heal and change some of my patterns, which is an exhausting but beautiful process and um, let go of this um, double life where I'm hiding part of who I am and trying to be what the world, what I think the world wants me to be and start to really get to know myself and hopefully be able to open up and be what my higher power has actually sent me to be without that me trying so hard stuff getting in the way. Um, So Thank you for letting me share a little bit of my story with you. And for those of you who are just getting into AA, um, it is a mysterious process, but I think the more we put into it, however your program looks, um, it can really, I really love how it has accentuated my life and it can fit in with what's already happening in my life. And I'm starting to notice the way my higher power shows up. The one example I'll give before I turn it over to John is that um, recently at work, I had um, a weird interaction with my boss where I got really mad, and anger was an emotion that I didn't really let myself feel before, and I would just get sad or depressed and sort of shut down and let other people, whatever, like, didn't know how to deal with it or stand up for myself. Um, So I got to feel this anger, and I didn't want to, like, do something that would make me potentially lose my job, and fortunately that day... The group I mentioned, the topic was anger. So it was like, oh my goodness, thank you. Thank God. This thing is coming up. Now I'm learning tools to deal with it and got to go through this process of with help, support from AA, from outside forces, from talking with people to really work through my anger instead of hide from it um, and got to stand up for my needs, but also maintain my dignity in the process because I gave myself space to reflect, get help and then decide how to move forward coming from like a calm place, not um, reacting from a triggered place. And that's something that I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't gotten to myself to this place of sobriety, um, which has helped me be comfortable with being imperfect and needing help and noticing where my higher power offers that through all of these different ways. Um, So thank you. I wish you all the best. um, And I'm looking forward to hearing from John. So my name's John. I'm an alcoholic. I know. Hi, everybody. Um, it is a privilege to, to talk about what's important. I think Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life a number of times, not only before I got here, but since I've been sober. Um, I'll try to be candid. Let's get intimate, shall we? Um, <laughs> if I can talk about what's really important, uh, I think that's the real secret of, of any relationship with what's going on. And it changes me. It changes my relationship with you, and it changes my relationship with whatever I conceive of my higher power today. Uh, it's grace and love that allows me to change. It's the 
the ability to pay attention and observe without judgment. Um, it wasn't always like that. Uh, I uh, I grew up in uh, Orinda, uh, child of the 60s. So, uh, you know, a big excursion, a road trip was going to San Francisco <laughs> and trying to score some dope, and uh, it was just fabulous, really wild. <laughs> uh, uh, I got to see, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and, you know, all the stuff and, and you know, drugs and rock and roll were just, just what we did. <clears throat> and I was always a part of it. I seemed like I was always in the peripheral part of it. No matter how much I tried to get in the mix, I just I just couldn't seem to do it. Um, so relatively speaking, I came from privilege. My folks uh, expected me to go to college. I did not know what that was. I did not know where I was going to go to school. Um, apparently, my mother applied for me. Uh, and so I ended up going to a very prestigious Catholic university in San Francisco. Um, very expensive. I was rather embarrassed when I was politely invited out. Uh, I, I ended my freshman year at a 1.7 GPA and... Um, I've been to the dean's list, or dean's list, no, dean's office, I should say, a couple of times. <laughs> um, so they said, you know, we don't want you back. And my mother reminded this guy that she'd already paid for the first two years' tuition, and if she wanted me to go, he was going to have to give the money back. And so that somehow got me on probation. Uh, I didn't find this out until later. But, you know, I was a guy who didn't care. It was all about me. It was just all about me, trying to get loaded and, trying to make it happen and get what I wanted. And and I couldn't figure it out. I was a guy that just never got it. I never never, never understood, uh, you know, what, what makes people actually go to the library and study? You know, what makes people, you know, maintain a relationship for any length of time? And it was a morbid deal. I, was, I had a couple of jobs going through college. Uh, worked in a mortuary, and I worked at a... Uh, a tow car garage. And so my job was to hotwire the cars when they came in off of the tow trucks and drive them up and park them and, and you know, uh, then go get the car when people paid their dues. And I really liked the blue collar life. You know, the blue collar life really appealed to me because it was like you earn it. You know, when you get done with the day, you've earned it. You've earned a day's pay. Uh, and I couldn't see where I'd earned my privilege. I couldn't see where I'd earned the ability to go to college or any of that other stuff. And a lot of guys I knew weren't quite so fortunate. I was also given the... This was not really clearly stated, but it was my understanding that uh, you're supposed to be better than everybody else. You're supposed to... Have, we're going to give you this standard that says you're better than everybody else. And, and, that's, and you're going to somehow have to show that, prove that. Um, I was encouraged to drink at home, if you can believe that. My folks were drinkers, and it was a real common practice to have, uh, on the weekends, it was, you know, a fizz or some Bloody Mary or something like that, uh, a beer or wine before lunch, beverages with lunch, a couple of cocktails before dinner, wine with dinner, so maybe something after dinner. Uh, and, and the liquor cabinet's there. You can have as much as you want as long as you don't embarrass anybody. You know, it means don't fall down, don't throw up, don't <laughs> piss anybody off, don't break the furniture. You know, and that is cool. And I, uh, I just learned to motor with the buzz on. You know, I figured that's what you do. Uh, and so in high school, the drinking kind of like what Malika was talking about, nothing real eventful happened. I got to talk to the cops and drive people home, and I thought I was a responsible drinker. Um, that started to change in college. <clears throat> you know, I'd, we'd go to a baseball game, and, you know, some guy would buy a half pint, somebody else would bring a six-pack, and I'd have to have a fifth, you know, and that was gone by the second inning. And I, you know, I, I kind of wonder why we're so anonymous here that, you know, that, we don't give last names or talk about drunks. You know, when I was a candle, everybody at Candlestick knew I was a drunk. <laughs> and they could see me in the upper deck wandering around, and then like, I hope he doesn't go on the field. And you know, I I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I just thought I was a social drinker, and extremely social. <laughs> I I love to drink. I love 
happy brain. It made everything better. It just made it all good. It made it all happy. I fit in. And that need to beat you somehow, somehow take what you have so that I can have it, uh, that kind of evaporated. Um, and I was never very good at anything. I didn't, you know, I thought I fancied myself a driver and I could shoot pool. Real good skills to get in college. It means that I wrecked every car I ever had, um, and I could drink for free. Um, and to this day, I mean, I walk by a, some dive bar and I hear a click of a pool ball, and I get, it turns me around like a magnet, like, oh, okay, here we go. Um, it didn't really start getting bad. I actually graduated from college, tried all the drugs there were, but ended up drinking. Um, things started going south when I graduated from college in 74. Um, I didn't stop drinking until 84, and this was about a 10-year period where things just really got sideways. Um, I'm drinking every day, but, you know, I'm just drinking. A, I drank a six-pack when I wasn't drinking, so I'm under control. It's all right. I told you I was wrecking cars. I also uh, seem to be able to do pretty good with relationships and uh, graduate schools. Uh, made a mess of everything I got my hands on. I, uh, you know, 10 units shy of a master's degree in biology. I decided to go to medical school. The only place I could go was Guadalajara. Uh, so I spent three years there and just, you know, left in the third year because it's not quite right for me. And then, uh, you know, a couple more graduate schools after that before I finally got sober. And, and so four different graduate schools and three different trades in 10 years. Um, I just batter things around, and and it, it just I just come to the point where it's time to go. It was a subconscious decision. I didn't understand where or why or what, but I gotta leave. I just gotta go. I just it's, I, uh, everybody's tired of my stuff, and uh, I'm not going anywhere. And I've wrecked everything, and it's time to go. And so I pick up and pull out. Where I would go, I didn't know. Uh, my last decent car wreck was Christmas of 1983. I flipped a Volkswagen upside down at uh, Ashby and Domingo, and I went through the windshield. I recall wiping the glass off my T-shirt, looking at this car upside down in the middle of the street, thinking, if I don't get drunk or loaded, none of this is ever going to happen again. Brilliant diagnostician, huh? So, uh, my sobriety date's not till the end of April 1984. So, there's a lot of drinking and trying to stop. You know, I tried being a vegetarian, I tried working out, I tried all of that stuff, and none of it worked. None of it worked. I, I figured I was a hard luck guy, and that's just the way it was going to go. Um, in between graduate schools, I had a, a job as a, as a millwright helper in a non-union paper mill in Alabama. My job was to help the guys install heavy machinery. And... Uh, and I've never been so hot or so cold working outside in Alabama. But that there was a time when I had a couple of toolboxes. It was a rain out. I didn't want to put them in the dirt. I put them on the back of this guy's pickup and talked to a friend of mine. The guy took off with all my tools. Stupid story. Uh, but I was resentful and stayed out drunk that night. And I recall going back the next day. It was It was hot. Uh, summer, you know, 80 degrees at 8 o'clock and 90 degrees at 9 o'clock and 100 degrees at 10 o'clock. And, and I'm working with this guy, Mr. Griggers, uh, Mr. Arthur Griggers. He was old. He was probably like 60-something you know, <laughs> in the trades. Um, and so I was the young buck. I was the guy who was going to, you know, I'll carry the toolboxes and do all the heavy lifting. And so I've got a half-ton come along, which is probably, I don't know, 30, 40 pounds and a toolbox about the same on the other side and I'm we're walking down this dirt road we got about a mile to go to this job that we're working at Mr. Arthur says uh say Mr. John he says see that piece of rebar in the dirt I said yes sir he says pick it up well I didn't want to pick it up but I you know insulin I, I set the toolbox down and made a big show it's a little three inch piece of number half inch rebar and I put it in my pocket pick up the stuff and go walking back to the job, you know. About 100 yards later, he says, do you know what that is, Mr. John? I said, it's a fucking piece of rebar, Mr. Arthur. 
<laughs> he says, no, no, Mr. John. He says, that's hardened steel. That comes from a tilt up. So that's, uh, you don't have a center punch, do you? If you're working with steel, you're going to cut it, burn it, punch it, drill it, mark it, whatever you need a center punch. And I, I didn't have any tools. And so I said, no, Mr. Arthur, I don't have a center punch. He says, when we get done with this job, we'll go back to the fab shop and make you a center punch. And I didn't quite know what to make of that. We, this guy was amazing. I mean, he's really incredible. Just simple tools and levers. And we were done with this job a matter of hours and, and went back to the fab shop. And then we took this little piece of steel and, and, and cut it off and ground it up and heated it up red hot and then quenched it and ground it up some more. And he says, there's your center punch. And it was a very humble act, and I and I didn't realize what had really happened with that. But uh, I think the analogy with what happens to us is largely similar. You know, that we're picked up out of the dirt. We've got qualities that most people don't recognize, and there somehow we're chosen to follow this path that we do reluctantly. Uh, there's only a few things I didn't want to do when I got here. <laughs> These are they, uh, with numbers on them. They all attended. So uh, I didn't pick those numbers, uh, just the same way as this rebar didn't pick the process on what it's supposed to do. Uh, it's somehow we get crafted into some useful tool, you know, and then we get put in a toolbox and nothing happens until we get a big clang on the head and then... Oh, we're you know we're we're making a mark somewhere, um, but it's you know this this trip has been largely passive for me. I knew I wanted to drink, but I wanted to be in control of it. I wanted to have my way with it. I wanted to be able to say I know what to do. And I said, you know, I'm not. I, I none of the stuff I've ever figured out has allowed me to stop drinking or get into trouble. Once I start drinking the way I want to drink, there's no telling what's going to happen. I will probably wreck the car. The money will be gone. But worst of it, I reached the point where I don't care. I don't care about me. I don't care about you. I don't care if I live or die. And if I'm driving or there's a loaded firearm, maybe I don't mind killing you either. And that's a very scary place to be. I don't add that up. I don't come to that. I don't calculate that out and get it all figured out before I got here. I just knew I wanted to die and didn't know what was going to happen. And it was getting close. I was afraid I'd be maimed instead of dying. Uh, so my last drunk was really quite uneventful. It was just another another night, you know, stayed up <clears throat> shooting pool, and the uh, sun came up, and I thought, oh, here we are again. And my last big plan was to put all the art supplies in the truck and go to New Orleans and be a street artist, and you would be so sorry you didn't take better care of me, um, or, call, or call Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't, I never, it wasn't my idea. I didn't have this planned out. I was not recruited. I was not, uh, I didn't, I just knew you guys dealt with drunks. Never been to a rehab. Never seen a drunk tank. Um, I just knew you guys dealt with drunks. And so I showed up and had a lot of misconceptions. You said, this is a program of attraction rather than promotion. Oh, there it is. You, none of you look too good, so you need a front man. I guess. <laughs> I'll, I'll step in. <laughs> and I really, I didn't want to be like you. I didn't want to be who you were. I didn't want to have to do what you did. I didn't want to have your lives, your experience. Um, and it was many, many years. I was here because I had to. I was here because I didn't want to drink. And it's occurred to me later that I want to be with you but I want my life. I never had that experience before. Um, I always thought I had to be somebody else. I had to be this archetype, this person that you would be impressed with. Um, and it never worked. I always lost. I always thought I had to beat somebody to win. And then we do this third step prayer. Um, and you ask me to do all kinds of stuff I don't understand, like the third step prayer. Um, Relieve me of the bondage of self. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means to say, build with me and do with me as you will. I do know what it means to say, take away my difficulty. Because I had lots of difficulties, and I figured if I could just 
get rid of these difficulties and I'll get my shit together, which is what's, that's all that's important to me. And I'm not coming around here, so I'm not getting any of you on me. And I'm going to get my stuff together. I'm out of here. And they talk about being honest and telling the truth. And, and really, my sponsor was one of the first guys. That, I mean, I'd give you a little bit of it, but my sponsor is one of the first guys where I could really open up and talk about what was going on because that's what he did. He gave me his example. And I recall distinctly saying that if I could figure out how not to drink, I'm not coming back here. He says, I hope you choke on your effing gratitude. <laughs> and it was like a pall came over me like, oh, it's kind of like we're done, huh? That's it? You know, we're, all, we're through? And I backed down. I, I, I just, I just I remembered that I wanted not to drink. And it wasn't about my pride. And his, he said, I'll do this for you. If, if he just said, I'll show you how to do an inventory, give me 50 bucks, it would have been over. I, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be here at all. Because then I own this thing. But he said, I'll show you what to do, provided you take this to somebody else. The only the only terms of the deal, and I had no idea what that meant that I would have a life that I could share with somebody else. I didn't it didn't really occur to me. I didn't know what God was. Raised a Catholic, I thought, well, look what they did to their front man. You know, I don't want any of that. Uh, I I can't. That's not really in my agenda. Uh, I don't see any of that. And they told me from the beginning, I'm going to hell, so I may as well get a leadership position you know, it's, uh, it just didn't work it did it, it wasn't the spiritual side that called me. Uh, but Alcoholics Anonymous did it speaks to me in a way in a very deep way to say yeah this you know when somebody tells the truth it, there's just a different vibration altogether that that I, I was not familiar with before it was you know I don't mind talking out of the side of my neck and then get over on you uh, I don't mind. Uh, I didn't mind taking. I just, I just had to get ahead. I just had to feel better. And and when then they said, uh, we're going to talk about what's really going on. And I had no clue what a resentment was. I had no clue what my fears were. And to this day, I mean, I, 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 I it was easy to admit to the fact I'm afraid of drinking because of what I do when I drink. Or I'm afraid of failure because of what I do to people who fail. But it's only been in the last few weeks that I realized that I'm afraid to accept God's love because I don't understand it. Because I don't think I deserve it. Because I can't own it. Because I can't manage it. So, it's been a hell of a ride. I, I started out really liking sobriety. I was I this killer apartment and top of Rockridge, 200 bucks a month for like 800 square feet and off street parking and three week view. And I'm making like 80 grand a year as a physical therapist. I got a custom truck and I'm racing sailboats. And sobriety's cool. You know, that's cool. Uh, that was probably about five or six years later. Uh, for some reason, I got married. Uh, my thought was okay, here's two people trying to get what I want. It didn't quite pan out. Uh, I went through a little period of depression from 1990 to about 2010, uh, when we finally said, "Okay, this you guys just gotta part ways." Uh, that was really the roughest thing I've encountered in sobriety. I've had houses burned down, I've lost jobs, I've lost my folks. My sister went through hospice. I've had been injured, paralyzed for a couple months, so I couldn't sit, stand, or walk. And, uh, but, you know, the domestic reorganization was probably the toughest thing I went through. And at that point, you know, after I'd written off the uh, house and all the other stuff, and I saw myself as a failure. You know, I couldn't, couldn't keep a marriage together. I couldn't uh, keep a family together. I couldn't hold a business. And that was, I just did an inventory a few weeks ago that those, were, those are still the same fears. I fear that I'm a failure because of that stuff. Uh, the instructions, the message I have from working step four, and I've done the other steps, and we'll get to those in a minute. But that instruction on fear is that we make a list of fears and why we have them. 
Uh, and then we ask God to remove the fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And it says that once we begin to outgrow the fear. And that was my experience just a few weeks ago, that those three fears I named weren't quite true. I could see that even though my rationale is this is because of the other thing, that didn't really hold up. And I was not a failure in that marriage. I did the best I could. Um, I didn't break up the mar the family. In fact, my ex and I and my daughter and I are closer now than ever. We can speak more candidly and we're there for more mutual support. And I haven't really failed the business. I just haven't brought it to market yet. Um, which leads me to the most uh, precipitous uh, gift of my sobriety so far was October. I had a just this in a, just horrible chest pain, and, and I thought I thought it was a hiatal hernia. I did some tests and a series of tests. They said, "No, you got stage four liver cancer, and it's in your pancreas, and we'll give you about six months, maybe or two years tops." And I thought, well, what are we going to do with this? You know, okay, God, what are we going to do with this? Uh, and I, I really didn't quite know. I thought, well, I, I die a tragic hero and everything's wrong. But that's kind of the whole mentality I had when I was going to go to New Orleans. Um, I, you know, I may have a physical disease, but I also have a spiritual disease. And in the treatment of the spiritual disease, I'm led to the fact that uh, if I pay attention to what my life is right now, I can accomplish my hopes and dreams. I don't have to trade with anybody. I, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy I know. And I'll tell you that because the, the life's work that I've had of this bouncing around this unique engineering, medical, structural, physical therapy background has enabled me to, to see have insight in a profession that, frankly, isn't particularly well disciplined. And I've... I've really been able to make some discoveries that I think are going to really be helpful. And I will present those at a conference in August. So uh, I get to be useful. And just like I've, we talked about that third step prayer that says, take away my difficulty so I can be helpful. When I show up to help people, I can't live. <coughs> I can't live. It's not like I've got an image to maintain or... It's, it's that kind of power and grace that, that comes from from love that was not my doing, as I said before. None of this was my idea. But it comes from the opportunity to take our life's experience and bring it to the, the real world. I used to think the, the past was a lock, that it determined my future. I've, been, I've failed at many things in the past, and that means I'm going to fail in the future. But the book tells us that, the past, that our past is the key. It's not the law. It's the key to helping somebody else. And that changes everything. Because what happened in the fifth grade or what my folks are like or what I think of you or what you think of me doesn't make any difference. It doesn't have to affect my decisions from here on out. Um, and that opportunity, I, I'm, I get to work on that every day. And I, and I have that... Uh, I have been able to accept the grace and love that you guys have given me. And that comes from very gently guiding people to what we know to be the truth. Maybe you don't have to drink again. You know, if you're new, this is your lucky day. This, this can be a fabulous sobriety day. Um, I've been through all of that stuff I talked about and haven't had to drink. That's not, that's not the idea. The most humbling part of this entire process it's not been taking the message to somebody else or uh, or even admitting who I am or, or what my past has been like or what I think in many cases. Um, the most humbling thing to me has been the fact that I can't get rid of my character defect. I'm selfish, I'm dishonest, it's all about me. Many years I spent, you guys were just accessories. I didn't, I didn't think of you as people. I thought, where, where is this going to take me? What, what's, the, what's the upside of this? Um, and that led me to a place with plenty of sobriety, probably 25 years of sobriety. You know, I talked about that domestic reorganization where there's no money and I'm hurt and everybody's dying and nothing's going to work and there's no, oh, I'll never have joy in my life again. That's self-pity. Uh, that's one of my character defects, and I thought, 
uh, well, I'll just blow my brains out. And then I thought, well, okay, do I use the 12 gauge or do I use the 20 gauge? And then that's really going to make a mess, isn't it? And then who's going to tell my daughter? Uh, and at that point, I realized, just like they talk about in chapter in page twenty four, that once we start drinking, we're beyond human aid. You know, and my character defects are the reason I drank. All the pain came from my character defects, not you guys, not the circumstances. It came from my response to that. And understanding that in an inventory is very important. But if you want not to drink, you're going to have to work all twelve steps. It's been my experience. I thought if I could just get through one or two, that's that's, a, that's the only instructions I ever read in anything. And I could be successful with just reading the first couple of lines. we got to go all the way through it. So it was a Thursday night, and I, I realized I got a problem, and I can't change it. I can't get rid of this ideation. I can't get rid of this unshakable faith in failure. I don't know what I'm going to do. So in the most humble way I could, I asked God to remove my shortcomings. My prayer was, okay, I've had enough of this shit. I'm going to bed. You fix it. Not exactly humble, but I didn't know what else to do. I highly recommend profane prayer. <laughs> Works like a charm. I'll share some others off mic uh, that, in fact, have really been quite profane and uh, the answer begins to unfold in just within minutes. So I went to bed and I slept like a baby. And Friday morning I woke up realizing that the sun coming in. This this day is not ten minutes. Do you have a five minute one? <laughs> <laughs> this day's not coming again. Let me take advantage of it. And in my meditation, the breath was. This breath isn't coming, let me savor it. That's not my doing. You know, I just wanted to be someone who appreciated what was going on. I am so much the guy who's thinking two weeks ahead and 20 years behind, and I'm not paying attention to today. And that's, you know, every time I've wrecked anything, it's been I'm not paying attention to what's going on. And, and that doesn't, that is less so today because of work on the step. Probably eight minutes now, huh? <laughs> so you got you got the same guy just doing different stuff. I've got more tools now. But I still have the same character defects. I wish they would go away. I have been able to see the other side of them. Most of that I get selfish, I hurt people. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea how bad they are. None whatsoever. I just motor, just collateral damage. That's just the way it is. Um, and I don't have to do that anymore. I think the the gift from working all twelve steps. I'll tell a couple of quick stories. One of them. I said I wasn't going to work with you guys. I said I was, I was going to figure out how not to drink and then get out of here. Um, I was standing in the men's room, and a guy stands next to me, and he says, I want you to be my sponsor. <laughs> I said, really? Uh, uh, why don't we talk about this later? Uh, we didn't shake on it. <laughs> uh, so I went back to my sponsor and I said, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. This guy, this guy is something else. He drinks two quarts a day and pulls the IVs out of his arm and to get to the liquor store in time. And he's living in a 74 T-board and T-board and plus he's old. This guy's like 50. And uh, I didn't think I could be responsible for his sobriety which was the reason I didn't want to do it. I thought I'd be in control, and I'd motor him into high light and happiness. And so my sponsor says, tell him the answer's yes, and I will keep you one step ahead of him. Well, it turns out he wanted me to sponsor 
him because I raced sailboats and I dated women. Uh, and he thought that was a pretty good, he wanted what I had. <laughs> I uh, was really reluctant all the way through that process. I really, have we got a five minute story? <laughs> Honest, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I could not be responsible for his sobriety. That was really clear. But I'm supposed to be responsible for my sobriety, not his. I didn't know that. And so this guy, this guy, in fact, embarrassed me into working all 12 steps. Um, we got through 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And I could begin to see this man with grace and compassion, and without judgment, just to be aware of what he was and what he was doing. About, I would have given him a 25-year chip. Uh, let me do the math, 34, 25. So eight eight years ago, except he blew his brains out. Uh, now the eerie thing about this whole deal, I he got pancreatic cancer, and the pain is so bad he couldn't stand it, and he blew his brains out. And I don't know, I I, I know what the pain's like, um, but I went to the doctor and they gave me morphine. I went to the doctor four different times, emergency room four different times. They kept giving, and finally we settled. At first it was ibuprofen. That's yeah, not working, doctor. Um, but the fact that he took his life occurred about the same time I was willing to take mine. And he, in fact, he did it first. I had none of the problems compared to what he was. But it makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck to realize that... Uh, <laughs> that he showed me a way that I did not have to take. You know, we can be good examples, bad examples, but it was a very clear example to me that well, maybe I may bless you. Maybe I don't need to do that. You know, maybe, maybe it's right for him. That's not for me to judge, but no, I don't think that's right for me. Um, and now, now I can witness that the pain is horrible. Um, but they got medication for that, and I got through that. What happens now? I don't know. I, I had a, I've had my third CAT scan, um, and they say, "Oh, the tumors are all the same size as they were the first time we looked." <clears throat> Great, I'm in remission. My daughter's got me on this nutrition thing that I don't know which is worse, but uh, <laughs> I'm taking supplements, and, I, and so her goal is we're going to go into remission. We're going to beat this thing. And we've all heard stories of guys that get these fatal diseases, and next thing you know, there's six months later and eight months later, and like nine, ten years later, like, Jesus, aren't you supposed to be dead yet? Like, what's the what's the story? And, um, I don't know. I'd like that, but I don't, that's not my call. And and the doctor says, well, we'll take a couple months off of chemo. Thank God. Um. And then uh, I asked her a few more questions about the detail of this particular exam. She said, well, it's not that precise. And I said, well, have you got something that's a little bit, you know, we're kind of dealing with different stuff? I kind of like to know. And she said, well, if we really know, then the, you're going back on chemo. Do I do, do I do that or not? So next week I have a discussion as to am I going to go back into that the labored state of, you know, we'll get you as close to death as possible, and if you don't feel like dying, give us another round, you know. Um, I've been there drinking. I don't like it. I don't like it sober. But if that's what it takes to be useful, maybe that's what it takes. I don't know what it takes. I know what it's taken to get me here. You guys have given me your life, and I, and I have a life. I wouldn't have had it any other way. I can tell you times when I was sober, I didn't, I didn't care about living. And, and it was just your grace and your love that kept me going. And it does so today. What keeps me going is I can be helpful. But there's a way i got to do it. Despite the physical disease, I still have a spiritual disease. And if I treat that, I'm okay. And sometimes it's up. I'll sit. You know, can't sleep. I'll sit 45 minutes in meditation, sometimes a couple hours. Uh, and then it's okay. And through all of that, 
my conclusion has been there's nothing wrong. There's absolutely nothing wrong. There's nothing there's nothing that's out of place. There's nothing that's not supposed to be. If I get to go to the big show sooner than you guys, I get a better seat. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? But I know there's nothing wrong. I don't I don't feel I don't feel sorry for myself. In many respects I have some trepidation and I need to pay attention, but I'm not afraid. And that's a gift. That's a truth of gift. Thank you very much for that. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.